uh, there's a bunch of institu institutional details that you need to know in order to appreciate the, the, the thoughts that I'm, I'm presenting to you. So, so I, will, I will go relatively slowly in these, uh, in these institutional backgrounds. Uh, by the way, that I'm going to spend, plan to spend at least uh, 10 minutes on uh, draw the connection between what, what's happening in the past 10 years on China, linking back to like what happened, what, what was going on about, uh, about 150 years ago at here, uh, in a way that they're very close. All right, so this is uh, really my motivation. I started this project uh, around 2013 when some, uh, there's a Kellogg China conference inviting, invited me to kind of give some broader assessment of Chinese growth, etc. Then I asked my, I, I did it myself actually. Uh, this is what I did myself. I just plotted a certain, certain time series of the important uh, measures of economic growth, right? On, on the, from the perspective of finance. Okay. So here I plot three, three time series. The first one is the bank, new bank loan over GDP. You're seeing that, you're just sort of like getting a parameter, a kind of a parameter of like how, how does the, um, China's growth is, is a field. Right, what's the way of that we finance our growth? Um, so, so, and the GDP is every year. The GDP new bank loan is, you know, for that year, how many, how much new bank loans extended out? The one thing that it clearly stick out is this 2009. That's the famous 2009 uh, stimulus loan, and today I will talk about it. Uh, it's a four trillion stimulus loan, and uh, it's affected the the Chinese financial market growth like afterwards for many many years. Okay. Uh, and what's I also plotted here are, are the other two lines. One is a little, a little bit green. Green is the new entrusted and the trust loans. For this talk, you don't need to know the difference between trust and the trusted. But if you are in interested, you can ask me, or you can take my course. Uh, uh, but I just putting them together. Okay. It just you think about it as like a non-bank, but it look like a banking. It's shadow banking stuff. Okay. Uh, putting together and then divide by GDP again, you see that uh, you know there was some in, be, even before 2009 when you were a kid, I guess. When I was a kid, I, I, so so around like uh, early 90s, I know the existence of trust in in China. Uh, many people talk about it. The role is slightly different, but it's there. It's just a small. What's happening is that after 2009, right? There's a some growth here. You see that uh, from here to here. Even though it lo look like small, but because GDP is big, right? When you divide by GDP, even even it's a very small trillion number. When you divide by some about like like eighty trillion, then it becomes small. So there's a slow small increase. But what's really happening is afterwards there's a like 2012, 2013. Later on, just really grow uh, quite quite a bit. And another line I draw is WMP. That's the uh, wealth management products that you might uh, hear from uh, different sources. Uh, wealth management products, you can think about it as a, is, is, is a similar product like a deposits product, deposit product. So it's, it's measured as a liability side when, when the, invest, when the uh, households are purchasing these wealth management products. Okay. Uh, obviously, then you're gonna think that uh, where this money go to, right? So, so then uh, that's complicated. So, as a result, that a lot of times, if you read the uh, Financial Times, sometimes they will put WMP then add on these trusts. That's wrong. You can't do that. The reason is because some some of the wealth management products are funding these trusts, so you have double counting issues. So, so, so but you know, in a way, just. The, the, Two different ways to measure the act, uh, shadow banking activity, so I just put them here. And what's in interesting is here you can see that in 2015 there's a some you know something goes down, something goes up. Those type of things you you should expect a lot when you read the Chinese growth. It's always like this, always like this. The you know top Beijing they knew they knew. It's just a much harder. It's very harder to manage it. So in a way, it's always like let you grow for some way. They're watching it. 
If it's too good to go too fast, I'm gonna push it there, and then the other side is just bumping up. So this is a kind of like like that that a phenomenon. What's what I'm trying to say that if you sort of seeing like there's some some balance off thing and putting them together, you will see a big trend is that in 2009 there's some bank loan growth goes down, and then afterwards after several years that the the the, the shadow banking gets up, right? So the the whole talk that I want to give you a, a force, a channel that are explaining this linkage and give you some evidence on that. And as a, you know, as in I'm I'm, I'm an academia, so I will show some rigorous analysis on and regression, etc. I hope that uh, you you see this type of thing. Um, so this is another way to show the the exotic pattern of China's. You know, almost uh, 10 years ago, right? 10 years ago, that a new bank loan over GDP. The, the, the difference here is the following. Is that here, I'm uh, taking the each year's new bank loan divided by each year's GDP. OK? And often the time you will say, OK, GDP is also changing. How do I know the change is mainly due to the bank loan, right? So one way to do it is just to show the, show the raw pattern. And, Okay, show, show that everything scaled by the 2004 GDP. So that's what I'm doing. If I show everything in terms of the 2004 GDP, so basically that we are starting from here and then to like this. So you can see that in 2009, there's a, there's a kind of drop, but you cannot see it at all. Why? Because it just grow 10% when you convert it to level, look like it grow 15%. Even though you know, 15 to 20, 10 to 15 is like a very big job, but it's not. It's still growing, right? Just, just, just there's some, and then you see the new bank loan. So this is basically saying that there's a bump, and later, later, later on you're gonna see something out. Okay. So this is another perspective that you want to see. Uh, it's the U.S.-China bond markets growth in the past uh, 10 years again. Um, so what I plotted here is top panel A is, the US, is China. And the bond market, to be honest, is something that uh, you don't see too much from the, from the Western media, media, also academia, et cetera. Uh, partly just because it's quiet. It's big, growing quite a bit, quite a bit in the past 10 years. You see the uptick trend. But it's just quiet and also like a very, very much detailed institutional knowledge you, you need to understand what kind of participants. While the stock markets, they, the, the rule that they're playing is similar to US, so it's easy to make connections, etc. But it is growing like, like that. Uh, in 2017, that's like that. And the three different colors are government bonds, financial bonds, and corporate bonds. Uh, you, you, you know, this is just you know, issued by the government. Financial bonds is the bonds issued by banks. Uh, it's important to distinguish these two for two reasons. One, uh, if, if it's a bond issued by banks, typically it's a safer. Right? Second is that these bonds issued by banks do not get directly goes to the real side. That's very important because bank is intermediate, right? Like they issue bonds and they, 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 they might make loans to the real side. And when we calculate how much the you know the loans you are making. You you know you, you should you should not double count again. It's 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 about the, the, the double counting issue. Well, for the corporate bonds, is it directly goes to the real side, and we we care. Okay, so you can see that for China, is about a twenty five percent is in the in the corporate bonds. Uh, the the government bonds is about a fifty seven point five percent. Overall, for China, bond over Chinese GDP at the 2017 is around 85%. So that's just the broader pattern there. And we grow like, you know, 10% to 85% in the past 10 years. This is the US comparison. US is also kind of uh, different uh, from the rest of uh, Western country. US has a huge amount of government bonds just because everybody loved US Treasury. It's uh, international, safe assets, etc. There's uh, some real reason for that. That's why it's, a, it's about 64 percent of the U.S. bonds over uh, an entire thing. And, but in terms of the fraction of other things, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a very similar. Takeaway: Chinese uh, bond market grow, 
grow very fast after 2013, 14. You know, that's something you should take a look at it. And uh, I basically, I want to connect all these things together. All right. Do, yeah. When I read these numbers, they don't they just, uh, add up to 200%? 200. Ah, this is over GDP. This is uh, adding up to 100%. I'm oh, sorry. This is add up to 201. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a basically, I, I should have just a two, which means that, you know, GD, bonds over GDP is about a two. A lot smaller, yes, yes, a lot smaller. Yeah. Relative to, relative. you know, re relative, yes? Not, not necessarily. All the entire banking sector, including security firms. So security firms are quite profitable. If you have a friends working at the security firms, they're earning big money. Uh, now, they are very sensitive to this market condition, obviously, but uh, but uh, but it is it is you know when when I was at college around the ninety eight and ninety nine, we were kind of get a good luck in the sense that uh, some good security firms get established, so we are able to we were able to to joining them as a first batch of employers. Of course, I didn't. Uh, then after 10 years, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty mature, pretty professional organizations. Okay, so summary. So what I want to show you quickly that, you know, you will see that the, the, uh, uh, the force, you know, uh, is a, again, again, I want to understand why do shadow banking activity and the bond market in China start rampant growth around 2012, 2013. There's a time lag I want to explain. Uh, I want to say it's a handover effect of 2009 stimulus time series. So I'm going to show you some time series of cross-section evidence. On this, uh, you know, if you can read the Chine uh, Chinese, you know what I'm talking about here. Uh, if you seeing some other 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 was uh, 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 journal articles, they sometimes translate it as this. But I call it the municipal corporate bonds I, for the re reason that I will explain to you. It's a half municipal, half, half, half corporate, and uh, that's because of the, some institutional tech, no, uh, a background that uh, I need to explain. All right, uh, it's really the, the, the presentation is drawn on two papers. There's one of the, uh, this paper, so you can see the title, it's similar. And the second paper is on explaining the details of the bond market and the interbank market. Into the, um, this is a handbook. So if if you are interested, or if you're getting a job that are remotely related or tightly related to this market, you definitely should take a look at it. I, I was explaining the history, you know, where it's coming from, the details, etc., and who are the re regulators, etc. All right. Uh, so let me explain the four trillion stimulus a bit. Four, tri four trillion stimulus plan. Uh, it's called a. Uh, uh, it, it's basically, this is the translation of Chinese. Uh, that's right after the crisis. Uh, so, so the fourth quarter, uh, the, the third quarter of the, uh, of the, of the um, uh, a, a, a export goes down quite a bit uh, for China. The export to US, and then you, you know, okay. for, for the obvious re reasons. Then what I want to emphasize here is just almost after a month, or two months that uh, we, we, we wrote out of this plan. While for, for the United States, uh, the ARRA, so that's a stimulus plan. It's a very different uh, nature of a stimulus plan. And a similar amount, but because of the sizes are different, relatively, it's quite relatively smaller. It's rolled out uh, almost uh, mid 2009. So think about the, the six month time, time lag of the China's reaction to the, to the, to the US reaction. Okay, it's mainly on in infrastructure. How was it implemented finances? So there's a bunch of papers try to study those type of things on the asset side, like how do they do infrastructure, efficiency, blah, 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 is crowding out the private investment. All these are very, very interesting questions. As a finance professor, I just intrinsically interested in the financial market growth. I was hoping that the financial market can grow faster Although that I think they already did a very, very fa big pace, good pace, but uh, just because I'm interested in that, so I will look at the liability side. Okay, so how does it implement the finance? 
mostly through the local government. So this is the implementation is through local governments. So these four trillion uh, stimulus plan, etc., is just through the local government. They are able to decide how do they spend the money. Uh, one trillion from Beijing, the rest is through LGFV, mostly in the form of bank loans. Ninety percent is of a commercial bank, and the other ten percent is about a policy bank loans. So if you don't know much about this thing, good, fine. You know, let me just uh, having a picture showing you the showing you the diagram showing you the where the money flow goes on. Okay, so what's really going on is that local governments are responsible for the four trillion stimulus plan. And by the way, that when I say responsible, Beijing or announcement, all these things, it's far more complicated than just one guy making the move. Okay, it's a big country at that time that. Uh, 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 Wen Jiabao and 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 Hu Hu Jintao, who went and and when that that government, the central government, is a is a in a, in a retrospective way is a, is a famous for its uh, kind of a little bit weak in the sense that they can't order everything out of from Beijing. So there's a lot of articles about that. So in a way, it's in a situation where we have all these complicated systems already installed, but the Beijing would like to roll out some investment plan. How did they do it? Okay. Uh, so here's the Beijing central government transfer one trillion RMB to local governments. This is a, was a, in, consists of a lot of standard stuff, right? They 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 all as always every year that Beijing will will transfer something to the local government. So that's standard. What's not standard is that they also ask them to borrow another three three trillion, because the total is four. Okay, so how? Usually, is uh, commercial banks why? Because in China, that uh, still, even though you heard a lot of financial growth, etc., banking is still the dominant one. If you look at the, you know, some metrics, etc. Almost every big money is coming from banks. It's just uh, very hard to change. Um, Beijing would like to change it in a, in a much faster way. Mm, it's, it's hard. It's hard. So they would think that it's just coming from commercial banking system. Oh, no. If you want to ask, OK, commercial banking, where does the ultimately money coming from? Obviously, it's from household deposits. But that's not the focus of the paper. However, there's a 1994 budget law that uh, very importantly shaped the, the entire growth path of the of the, of the China also the also the game played between the central central government and the lo local government said that local government cannot directly borrow obviously that's in response to some very bad things that happened before 1994 but I don't, I don't want to get in, into that the fact is that after 94 Zhu Rongji, Zhu Rongji is the one responsible for that, saying that you cannot direct borrow. Okay. As a result, that the common practice is is the following. It's like you know Beijing know it, um, and uh, it's just just common practice, and it, they they just will watch it to see that what will happen. Okay. So typically, what will happen is a local government going to set up uh, some local government financing vehicle. Uh, those are not lo local governments. Those are local SOEs. We call it local SOE. So there's a, some central SOE, right? There's, you heard about it. There's a, something called a local SOE. Basically, the SOEs owned or owned a majority by the lo local government. Um, so that's the, 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 the and they count it as a corporation. If they do investment or but they borrow, it's corporate debt. It's corporate debt. Okay. Okay, so how does this, this LGFV uh, uh, finance typically is the following, is that the local government as an equity holder, they're injecting land. This is their free resource, and uh, to be honest, that's their only resource, but it's pretty good anyway. So they're injecting piece of land, right? Just, just put it in land, this is, the, you know, this is the my land, but then I put it in uh, my, I meant like a local government. Just put it into the, into the, into the LGFV. And then LGFE using this land to borrow as a collateral from the banks. So in total, it's about a 2.7. As I said, that it's 90% of the three trillion. And then the rest is coming from some policy banks, but it's kind of small. So in a way, that's basically that we have something going on here, that these 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 loans 
uh, is about a three to five year maturity. And then my story is just telling you that uh, what happens after three, five years later. Right? These, these are mature and you need to re, re, uh, refinance and uh, how do you do it? Uh, so in 2010, China reverted back to its normal policy, credit policy uh, rule. You can see from here, it's very clear. Uh, in 2010, actually, they already kind of realized this problem, and then here. And what happened after 2012, 2013, there's a regime shift, you might know. So this is also contributed a bit. Anyway, so now we are, we are basically, you know, planted some seed there. Then afterwards, people all changed. But it's, it's there. It's there. You need to deal with it. Okay. So we're going to document the two. One is a total stimulus loan high over effect. One is a need to roll over finance. Uh, and then the second is a long-term infrastructure projects. Right? What they are doing is a long-term financial structure. Project is sometimes is a bridge. And the bridge is going to get to generate uh, profits after, let's say, 10 years maybe. Um, but they need to roll it over about three to five years or so. Okay. Um, around 2011, 12, then they turn to the non-bank sources. Uh, who are they? So this is uh, where you link back the link to the to the. I I, I start linking to the uh, shadow banking and the and the bond markets, etc. Okay. So there are four major debt liabilities that are sitting on the LGFV. Okay. There's uh, there's uh, some systemic r reports that I can read, and these are the uh, the four major I items. One is bank loans. Still, there are a lot of bank loans sitting on the LGFE's uh, balance sheet. Uh, there's a something called a municipal bonds. Don't confuse with the municipal co corporate bonds. There are different things. Okay, I know it's complicated, but that's the reality of China. Uh, just because uh, all these policies that you know start some some point there, and there's something going on again, then we we put a patch here. There, here, there, and then in the end, it's, uh, it's you know, it's complicated. But, but we need to deal with it, and also that the, the, the economic force are very simple in the end. It's just that the, the, de the details matter. Okay, so there's a something called a municipal bonds. Municipal bonds grows up around, uh, really, is about uh, 2015. So if you read the data, after 2015, there's a big growth of, a, of municipal bonds. So I will explain all other things and then come back to tell you that this, what, what do I mean by municipal bond. Um, then, then this is the thing that uh, I, I will focus on. This is the, the municipal corporate bonds. They are, they are corporate bonds, okay, and the LG. Oh, I want to mention this is the thing that uh, if you read the Financial Times, there's a famous article, Financial Times, that said that China's debt, debt is over, you know, the debt problem is huge, right? The picture you show, you see, you should read it as that China government debt is fine, household debt is growing but manageable. It's the corporate, it's corporate debt that really, really big, right? But you will see other articles saying that oh, local government debt is a big problem, blah 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 blah. Why? Because they're the same thing. It's the LGFV. It's the local government's state-owned. Entity borrow, so th so therefore that uh, when you measure it, on the one hand it's measured as a corporate, on the other hand a cor you can measure as a uh, local government. So this is uh, the tricky part of it to understand. Okay, then you have this uh, trust and interest loans, um, and uh, um, other th uh, the other three are non bank debt, uh, often with implicit guarantee. Okay, so you see the you see the trend. Uh, this is the bank loan is going down. Afterwards, this is basically my story that afterwards they need to roll it over uh, to, to re shift from the non -ba bank to non-bank. Then here I plotted that one is this MCB. That's my focus. I'm going to do some cross-section you know, analysis on that. Uh, the green one is basically the MCB plus trust and plus the plus the muni, muni bonds. The big uptick here is mainly because of the muni bonds. Okay. So what's the muni bond? The muni bonds basically look like uh, U.S. muni bonds. You might think about, it, okay, uh, but much safer, to be honest. Why? Because muni bond, Chinese muni bonds are really li literally, you know, backed by central 
central central government because all these muni, muni bonds budget need to be approved at Beijing. Okay, so that that's a different level of safety. Now, why it's 2015, and what's the purpose of this this reform getting out? Is it because in 2014, many regulators and also Beijing realize this is something that we need to address it, which means that you know the local government of financing vehicle have trouble in rolling over. They go to the market, market participants sort of seeing like maybe this is a government, maybe it's not, who knows. And that's uncertainty not good for the growth of a, of a financial market. Beijing said that, okay, fine. You know, starting from now, I'm gonna start to replace some of the maturing debt that are issued by local governments through this muni bonds. Basically, that it, I know that, it, basically Beijing said, I know there's a bunch of stuff going on there, and it's issued by someone that actually I not necessarily trust, okay? But they use my name to, uh, to, to issue it, that's why the, the, the price is the high spread is low. Beijing said that, okay, enough is enough, let me just take a, take a step, saying that, okay, let me look at your books, figure out who's good, who's bad. Only these good guys, I will say that your bonds, your debt, when you get mature in 2015, I will replace these bonds by my debt. So that's like a bailout, kind of a bailout, but it's far, far from bailout. It's a basically replacement of the, uh, of the uncertain bonds by the certain bonds, okay. So that's, that's the background of that, but that's not important to understand the, the paper of uh, uh, this paper, so I will just go for that. Okay, this is another, another picture on the uh, MCB. It's just growing like that. It's ba basically my, my, uh, my story there. Okay, so I'm gonna present two, two, three pictures on the core in empirical evidence, okay? So in order to show you that uh, this is my story, right? The time series is uh, typically we will say it's motivating. We will never say that it's it's a done deal. Like we will say, okay, who knows all, the, all these things. So typically, when when do the you know a little bit more serious re re research, you will say let's try to lo look at other implications, especially cross section. The cross section implication will say the following: is that if you look, look at the areas of province with more bank loan field stimulus in 2009, then later on they should have more other activities go going on because that they need to they need to. Uh, get out from here, they need to roll over. Okay, so so what i trying to do here is some preliminary evidence is that I I calculated the abnormal 2009 bank loan over GDP at the province level. When, w w what do I mean by abnormal? It's basically the, at the, that measure at the 2009 minus the average bank loan over GDP in the past four or five years. Right? Imagine this is basically steady state and then just bump it. Uh, and then I calculated abnormal later MCB issuance for over that, right? And then you do the plot for every year, okay? And that's the scatter plot evidence that I'm showing you. Basically, if if you are the province, let's there's some province that you're changing, you might heard about them and all the things that. If you are the province at the 2009, you have a. Uh, this is abnormal, sorry, I just didn't, didn't put it abnormal there. Abnormal new bank loan is higher than the later years you indeed, that uh, you are the one that uh, you have to roll over a lot. This slide is for someone who gets trained a little bit in serious economic tricks that are basically what I do is putting all these things into a regression. What's the, perp what's the benefit of a regression? Then a regression will tell you more about a statistical, in in you know, in, uh, significance and you can control a lot of other things. So the way I do is basically I take the MCB, that's the that's the bond, that's what I'm looking at, multi support corporate bonds. I T, I, I is the province, T is the time, so every year, okay? So it's a big panel, panel data, okay? Mm -hmm. Then I regress on a bunch of stuff. What do I regress? First, I have a province fixed effect. Some provinces, they just love the MCB, so that's fine, right? Uh, then I have a time, time fix effect, so that, that's good. And then a bunch of, what's key here is basically is the, the shock at the 2009. That's the bank loan abnormal 
over GDP for that particular province. And then say that, okay, here's a shock in 2009, right? And I would expect some reactions from the left-hand side to that shock. But what's more importantly, I want to see the over time. You see the beta tau, one like indicator of tau, that's just after the 2009. Is this the shock initially happened in 2009 have a huge explanatory power for the later evolution of the MCBs? Right? That's, that's basically the, the, the econometrics that I'm playing around. You can run this regression, and what you should see is the following. Is that uh, we have a 2004 to 2015, OK? What you should see that a shock is that happening here. That should not explain anything here, no? Uh, because, you know, who knows? At that time, was, in 2004, has not happened yet. It's kind of a surprise to us, to be honest. Around the 2009, this is the 2009, you, you should have a little bit of a reaction because that, you know, this is a, it's one of the, one of the financing via, uh, uh, method. However, the main point of this paper is saying that afterwards there should be like this, which means that at 2012 or 2014, that the explanatory power, this beta, beta should look like that. I'm plotting beta, okay? The beta is the explanatory power or the sensitivity of the future MCB on the, B, uh, on the bank loan should be much bigger when the province gets to the time that you want to want to refinance it. Okay. okay, so that's the that's the result, and you see that that's basically what's what what you see, what you observe. Uh, so as I said, uh, we we fixed it to the nine, in two thousand nine. There's a little bit over there, but the, the bigger part is just in the later years. Okay, I didn't expect explain too much about that. Uh, there's still some endogeneity concern. You know, if you were kind of heard about those words. Uh, so I have some instrument uh, amendment variable. Instrument variable is a when a provincial governor is in late term. What we I really want to want to get is basically the saying that uh, suppose there's a some force somehow randomly put one province at that time doing a lot of bank loans for some exogenous reason. Right? Then if I see later on that indeed you have more MCB assurance, that's more assurance. Otherwise, you're always asking yourself, what, what explains the initial change? Maybe it's correlated with the future, right? This is the standard way. What I did here is the late term, which means that if, that at that time of 2009, the provincial governor at that point is in its year, that a, let's say third year, or fourth year, which means that it, that governor already pretty much familiar with the economic environment, etc. and they, should be much easier to implement whatever the Beijing law. This is the first uh, uh, the uh, first logic. The second logic is saying that when they get to the to the second uh, after two years or th three years, the chance of their getting promoted is much higher. Therefore, they have more incentive to follow whatever the Beijing law. Okay, and that's this is like a commonly documented in the literature. What we are doing here is just using that fact as a as the as a, as an instrument. Okay, so this is what you see from the, in the in in instrument. So it's ba basically just, just the, this is the most uh, concrete and uh, uh, convincing evidence from. The, from. the other thing that uh, you know, we also did something which is interesting is that uh, not only I, I have the total of MCB, I also have different uh, purposes of MCB. That's a little bit more direct if you look at the uh, time series. So here's what's going on. This is also linked to the final point I want to say is that a financial market is a very is a luxury goods uh, to to the country. To be honest, if the U.S. is so good. Uh, I, I really admire it. I, I was hoping, as a finance major, that I was hoping China could do it. We're slowly growing to do it. Here's one 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 why this is a good thing. That if you have a bond, you want to issue a bond, you need to issue a prospectus. Right? It's a pu publicly traded security that you need to tell us what it is, right? So every MCB that are issued by these LGFVs, they will issue a prospectus, and therefore we can read. They tell us what they do, okay? 
I did, I did classify them into three categories. One is the new MCV to repay. So they indeed tell, tell the investors saying that I'm issuing this MCV to repay my maturing bank loans. Okay. The second component is they say that, oh, I want to do some investment. The third is like other, which means that I, I want um, to do some, like um, um, making up some working capital, et cetera. Okay. So you see the time series plot is that the, the investment is bumpy like, uh, like the, the, this, but the new MCV repay is growing like crazy after 2013. 12, 2013, 2014. But take a grain of salt of these evidence is that it's self-reporting. So I talked to all these industry people, et cetera, that you know, it's very, it just, just I do not know how, how much that I should uh, trust them. But in a way that it seems like before 2014, uh, around, around that time, it's okay just because that even the Beijing, right? Even Beijing is recognized as a problem. There's some, some way to, to deal with it. So why don't we just, uh, just tell the truth? All right. So this is uh, another estimation that I could do the repay, could do the investment on the same issue, the same thing. So, so that's another good thing. I'm going to, um, uh, uh, one thing that I could do is that uh, using the, using the regression coefficients here, sort of to estimate the, the maturity of loans, right? Because I know that uh, how much you need to repay. I know that $1 of bond to the nine is that much. I know that uh, in total, you know, how much you use from other sources to repay that. So you need to repay a certain amount of debt, and this is over time. So when accumulating all these coefficients together, adding up, I can calculate uh, what's the, the average, land, average maturity of a bond loan. It turns out to be 3.9, so 3.9. It's consistent with the other sources. There's a bunch of sources to report these type of numbers. Unfortunately, I do not know the individual loan data. If I would know, I wouldn't. I don't need to do, do this. Uh, okay. Here is the investment side. Um, the the uh, so so indeed it's helping the investment, but uh, it, it's pretty noisy. So I I do. I don't know how, how much that I can take that. Here's a link to the shadow banking. So you see that uh, the o over years. So now I, 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 I try to tell you that uh, uh, there's a link between, between the, uh, the, the, the rolling over the MCB and the shadow banking. So this is the local government non-bank debt over the shadow banking. More and more become higher and higher and higher. Okay? So in a way, shadow banking problem is a local government debt problem. Uh, I'm going to skip that. This is something that, you know, it's important institutional details. That a lot of people will say, okay, in, in United States, we never count the bonds as a shadow banking. Never. You shouldn't. Exactly because the financial market is supposed to be transparent, uh, right, all these things. In, in China, it is. Like, it's also that uh, when you issue the bond, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty transparent. The difference is that who is investing it? Who is investing it? In the United States, it's a typically insurance companies, pension funds, etc. Right? In China, your insurance company also invests in it, but for a while, it's mainly the wealth manual products that initially I was explaining to you. The wealth manual products are issued by the banks, and then they just uh, get to the finished, uh, in, international uh, um, interbank market and then buying it. So this is the estimation of how much the, uh, the, 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 the MCV is held by the wealth management pro products. It, around December 2016 is about 62%. And this is, I'm sure it's underestimated just because a lot of uh, um, wealth management products investment, I cannot, you know, they, can, they do not report. There's no way I can, can know, know that. Okay, good. So let me just uh, halt a little bit, then, then try to tell you that uh, uh, this is a more, more recent thing. It's not uh, in my paper yet. Uh, so I'm re revising this paper. Uh, during the revision, I was pushed to, to read a lot of uh, uh, history of the US banks, which I did not know at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was tra trained at the, uh, I, I was a Tsinghua graduate. You know, it's after 
almost. The, I went to college in 95. At that time, the financial market has not established yet, but sort of there, right? Um, so didn't know too much. And then when I got to the US, all we learned is uh, what happened after the World War II. Right? I always thought that the Fed, the, Fed uh, the central bank is always there, never, never, never being a, a situation where we don't have the central bank. That's not true. So uh, I want to tell you that China's shadow banking today, sorry that I have them, has striking similarity with the US history. So especially the national banking era. Um, so what's the start? Uh, uh, how many people heard about the national bank here in, in this audience? <sighs> you guys are similar then. <laughs> Same as me, OK. Um, okay. I know a lot of Chinese history, to be honest. So you should know <laughs> Chinese history way, way, way longer than here. Come on. <laughs> uh, so in, the, in the 1963 to 1912, it's called a national banking era. At that time, there's no central bank. OK, there's no, no central bank. It started with the passage of a national banking act. This is 1864, sorry, 18, 1860, which ended the so-called free banking era. So what happened before this 1863 is even more wild. Okay, everybody can establish a bank and then just compete because at that time we believe we here believe that it's the it's a competitive banking. You know, uh, everything should be competitive. Everything should be free. Okay, but then realize that it's not good. You shouldn't do that. Uh, then they passages the National Banking Era uh, uh, Act. The passage of that act basically says that okay, bank has to be regulated. You couldn't, you know, establish a bank. So you get some so-called seniorage benefit, right? You can issue more money. But you need to subject to the heavy, tight regulation. So that's the national banks. Um, and uh, around that uh, national banking era, because its design has its, its flaw, there's no central bank mainly, and there's other design flaws, uh, there's a frequent banking panics. So almost like once every 10 years. Okay, and then the last one is a 1907 panic, triggered by a run on trust companies. Trust companies, which is, says that like in the old time, there's a lot of trust companies adding this land, just like what happened now in China, uh, which led Fed led to Fed as a central bank in the United States. Fed is established in 1913. 1913. The economic background of a, na a national banking era is basically there's a huge amount of industrial revolution in the Northeast to the settlement of the West. So there's a, right, the, 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 I, I do not know that much about it, you know, history. It's just, you know, and there's a, some war going on here, whatever. Um, the settlement of the West, so there's a lot of stuff you need to be done during the process from the mid way Chicago can, can consider as West at that time, but you know we need to go there. So therefore, you need a lot of railroad construction uh, in U.S. and which is like uh, uh, infrastructure in China today. There's a new industry craving for financing, but the national banks cannot. Why? Because exactly because of the act, the passage of the law, a pa passage of the National Banking Act is saying that look, look the whatever happened. To, Previously, our free banking era is not good. We need to establish some banking system, which is called a real bill doc doctrine, which says that I typically only finance if you have a working capital type of thing. Right? You are the you are the merchant. You are the barter. You know, just do standard stuff. Don't don't do crazy stuff. And that ha heavily regulated. However, there's an industry really really needs financing. Real world, that's not a barter, that's not a you know exchange, all these it's just not standard stuff. As a result, that all these Western states start to to do those so-called regulatory arbitrage or regulatory competition, whatever you call it. Basically saying that there's something un unmet demand, let me create something to meet that. So this is the states in the West started imposing less restrictive re regulations, that's so-called state banks. So if you read a bunch of the, uh, the, these type of things, you will see something very weird, that, which is not in China, is that you have a state chartered banks and a federal chartered banks, which I never understood why you do this. Right? Obviously, this is because of that. Uh, 
and uh, and not only that, these state bank uh, state states they they also allow for the trust companies to be a active around that time. Okay, so they are state chartered financial institutions, and what they are doing. Okay, this is a trust company according to Carlos So, 1970, page 99. So let me read, incorporated under liberal state laws, trust companies quickly extended their, their activity far beyond those usually associated with service to a fiduciary institution. Beginning 18, 1890s, trust companies took on most of the functions of both commercial and private banks. They accepted deposits, they made loans, participated extensively in reorganization, railroads, blah, 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 all these things. They do everything, okay? This is essentially what Chinese trust companies do, at least in 2015, where Beijing has not uh, cranking down them yet. Okay, so this is is coming from a a conclusion of of, of an interesting paper in Neo. In, according to him, that the trust companies in U.S. history did three things: uh, invest in new industrial securities on the asset side and issued the deposits to expand the money supply. Okay, that time, and then they helped to establish a financial market to feed the real economy. Okay. Third is that uh, they are collected uh, closely linked to the financial market, to the to the to the other commercial bank at that time, so-called money trust. Obviously, that's a bad word. Okay, even though it's called a trust, it, it's a bad word. Just saying that it's a monopolistic. In China, that's exactly what we are doing. It's the trust or the shadow banking supports the infrastructure, real estate, private firms, generating a savings vehicle. And that's the important savings vehicle for China in, ter in terms of the int interest rate liberalization, uh, uh, interest rate liberalization that we did in the, in the, in the past 20 years. Uh, that accelerates the corporate bonds market at an astonishing speed. So you, you already seen that. Um, without, the, without this push, I think it's not that, will not that be fast, right? China started the, uh, the bond market around 1997. We established the so-called interbank market. It's slow. It's slow. You need a demand somewhere so that it, it have some urgency, and then 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 the market market start. You need a catalyst in order for us to having a leap forward to a financial market, and and that's that's. Uh, Okay, so I have a structure to putting all these things, uh, uh, things together. A lot of people say the, there's a uh, stimulus to have a unintended consequences. I want to give you a slightly positive spin on that, which, you know, it, in my perspective is that if the Beijing uh, closely monitor that, uh, closely seeing that uh, um, things are not as bad as that. And uh, actually the re reformist, you know, in China, typically you have a reformist and those those like conservatism. It's always a fighting between them. Reformists they should benefit quite a bit from this because then it's become a necessary um, push for, for for these two people to have something. Okay, so let me just having two slides to tell you the looking forward. I I guess that you guys want to know. Um, maybe I will just stop here uh, because of the time. So